and it's doing lots of funny things that we don't completely understand. So I'm not going to have all the answers, but I'd like to start out by telling you what we know about the star, what we knew about the star, how many people learned about the star, and then tell you what happened about a year ago. So let me let me move on to uh, the constellation Orion and. Perhaps I don't have to tell all you experts which one is Betelgeuse, the bright orange star in the shoulder of the constellation Orion. Now, people ages ago knew about Betelgeuse. I was amazed to find out that if you go to the southwestern part of France and go down to the Lascaux Caves or look at the reproduction and look carefully, and I think it's called the Hall of the Running Bulls, um, you'll see that there are marks outlining the constellation Orion um, as well as Betelgeuse here. Can you see my my, I'm wiggling my little arrow around, uh, along with you know Taurus the bull, and along with the Pleiades here off the shoulder of the of the raging bull. So, people have been looking at Betelgeuse and thinking about it for a long, long time. This is several twenty thousand or so years of years ago. <clears throat> now. Uh, it was about a century ago, actually, in uh, December 1920, when Betelgeuse made the New York Times, and it was even above the fold, which is considered a real mark of, of, uh, of achievement and of interest, because for the first time, they measured the diameter of a star other than the sun, and this was at Mount Wilson Observatory by creating an interferometer by putting eye beams out on the edge of the 100 inch telescope and they measured the diameter and um, the the uh, time said it was the colossus of the skies that it's just a, an enormous star and they gave it an, just such wonderful um, public relations as we would say <laughs> nowadays and we celebrated this centenary this centennial um, at the Astronomical Society in Hawaii at the beginning um, of, of uh, 2020. Okay let me summarize a little bit about Betelgeuse so you know what what we're looking at it's a red supergiant star and it varies uh, it's what we call semi-regular which means that it has several periods, uh, but, but they're not always 100% um, regular within plus or minus a year or something. It's uh, fairly close to us. As a matter of fact, the light that we see started in about 1300 AD. It's 700 or so light years away. Um, the fact that it's big and the fact that it's close means that we can actually look at it in more detail than any other star other than our own sun. Uh, it's cool, 3,600 degrees, and it's a very massive star, perhaps 17, 20 solar masses, uh, and it was probably more massive when it was first born uh, on the main sequence. The other point about Betelgeuse, as we've said, is it's big, really big. It's about a thousand times the diameter of, of our sun. It's rotating. It takes 36 years to make one rotation, which actually is somewhat surprising. And that's another story <laughs> in itself. But the fact that it's big, really big, um, than other stars. I mean, here's our sun. This happens to be a French slide. So the sun is called Soleil over here. But you see it's a little dot. And Betelgeuse is about a thousand times larger in apparent size or in real size, I should say, um, than our sun. And larger, the next competing uh, uh, star for that is uh, Antares, and then you work your way through Alpha Tau, Aldebaran, and Rigel, and then all the other smaller stars, Sirius, the, the white dwarfs. So this is one of the largest stars visible to the naked eye, and that's that's been a real attribute that we've been able to um, capitalize on. As a matter of fact, if we put Betelgeuse at the center of our solar system, it would extend out to Jupiter. The surface would extend all the way from the center of our solar system, the sun, all the way out to Jupiter. And because it's so big, we can resolve its surface. Um, first, we did that with Hubble in the ultraviolet, and now with large telescopes and interferometers on the ground, we can resolve the surface. And we're seeing a lot of unusual things, quite different from the sun. The sun was the only star 
prior to observing Betelgeuse, the only star where we could observe the surface. But the sun is a very uh, small star. It only has one solar mass. Betelgeuse is 20 times bigger, um, more massive, and a thousand times bigger. And so we might expect to find different uh, structures in the atmosphere, and we certainly have. So let's take a look. Let's move on here and give you, let me tell you just briefly um, how Betelgeuse fits in uh, with all the other, um, other stars. Um, the star, this is just a plot showing uh, the positions of various stars. The fainter ones are at the bottom and the brighter ones are at the top. And the hotter ones are to the left and the cooler ones are to the right. And most stars are start out in what we call a main sequence, which is an ordering of stars by their mass. And the more massive stars are hotter and brighter. And here's Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is cooler and brighter because it has it is evolving. And we'll talk about how stars evolve in, in just a minute. But these giant stars like Arcturus and Pollux and Antares and things are all cool and very, very bright. And of course, white dwarfs are faint. Here's Sirius down here. They're hot, but they're small, and they're very faint. Stars generally are formed, when they are formed, they fall on what we call a main sequence. That was that line that ran from the hot, bright ones here down to the cool, faint ones um, on the right of this particular picture. They start on the the main sequence, and as, as they process nuclear material and change the processing sort of food from one element <laughs> to another, they evolve to become uh, blue supergiants or red supergiants or maybe even, even red giants. Now the low mass stars, as they evolve and use up their fuel, will turn into white dwarfs. But the massive stars, such as our friend Betelgeuse, is going to end its life um, as a supernova. The current state of Betelgeuse, as you've seen from the previous slides, is highly evolved. Actually, it's used up all of its hydrogen fuel and the core has contracted. And right now it's fusing helium. It's first, it, it uh, made, worked on hydrogen, used up the hydrogen. It's now fusing helium uh, into carbon. I mean, you realize that all the elements that, that make us up come from the stars. I mean, the iron, the calcium, the sodium, all these things are made in the centers of stars. So these stars are working hard for us. <laughs> so now the, um, because the, the, uh, the core of the star is much, much hotter, it's fusing helium uh, into carbon, and then the star expands. And that's why it's so large, it's so big, it's, as we said, it would fill the orbit of the, in the solar system out to Jupiter, and it's cooled down to about 35, 3600 degrees. Now, what's the history of Betelgeuse? For a long time, actually it was in around 1840, uh, when they first tried to record, obviously not with any uh, sophisticated equipment such as we have today, they started recording the variability of Betelgeuse. And uh, I mean, I'm sure Aborigines in Australia had noted this prior to that, but we have no record of, of that. So you can see, here's a, here's a plot of what has happened since about 18, 19, 18, 1900 up to 2018. And you can see that it's, it's varying up and down and up and down. It turns out it has two periods. It has the a, about a 400 day period, uh, which is, is due to pulsation of the outer atmosphere of the star. And then there has a longer period, which is somewhat controversial, that's on the order of several thousand days. And it's thought that that may reflect the appearance of surface, large surface structures, in particular, large convective cells. It's not clear, but the 400 day period is the one that we're particularly interested in um, at the present time. So because Betelgeuse is so big, we realized several years ago that we could make an image of it with a very special camera that was then uh, on the Hubble Space Telescope. 
the so-called faint object camera. And we could take an image in the ultraviolet continuum. This is just a broad band, how much flux in the ultraviolet. Equivalent to colors like B and V and R that you know from know and love for, from optical studies. And we discovered at the time that the ultraviolet gave us an image, a size that was three times larger than its optical size. This is because in the ultraviolet, we're observing very hot material. We're observing material that's hotter than the surface of the star. And just as in our sun, our sun possesses a corona, a hot outer atmosphere, Betelgeuse also has a warmer outer atmosphere. It's not as hot as the sun, but it's much, it causes the appearance in the ultraviolet, in this hot continuum, to be larger than what we see in the optical by about a factor of three. And that was perfect for the Hubble Space Telescope because then we could achieve about 25 resolution elements over this big ultraviolet disk. And we found for the first time, very surprisingly, a big hot convective spot on the star. We then continued for a period of years using the Hubble Space Telescope before they removed the faint object camera, um, looking at Betelgeuse to see, well, what happens in the ultraviolet? What happens in this outer atmosphere? So what I have here is a montage of different pictures of Betelgeuse over a period of four years. And in the upper left corner, this uh, square marked HZ4, this is a white dwarf. So this is a very small, hot star. And you can see that it gives us a very tiny image, just, you know, three by, well, four by four, four pixels. But then we went to observe Betelgeuse uh, with the same exposure time. So this is the same, and, the, and the, uh, the camera did not degrade. We have the same sensitivity. And you can see it started out being dim at uh, when we started. A year and a half later, it was brighter. Then it got dimmer again, two years. And you can see the variation in both the appearance and the position and the strength of this ultraviolet, um, uh, ultraviolet atmosphere. So Betelgeuse is not only varying in the optical, but we also see the outer atmosphere um, is, is varying substantially. And subsequently, techniques have developed, in particular, uh, interferometric techniques um, are used in, in the infrared to image Betelgeuse. And I just show you some samples here then. The one on the left, which was done in the infrared band, the H-band around one micron, show these two bright um, hot spots uh, in the outer atmosphere. This is lower, a little bit lower than what we're seeing in the in the ultraviolet. It's close to the to the optical size of the star. And then there's simulation, so people are trying to simulate these large convective cells. You know, convective cells happen when you have hot gas on the bottom of the star, the lower la layers of the atmosphere, and it wants to rise. So it rises up it cools off and then it flows back down again. And that's called convection. And we see these enormous cells on the surface of Betelgeuse. I mean, these are really big. Um, I can remind you that we have a new solar telescope on Haleakala volcano in Maui. And that just recently imaged the sun. It's the largest solar telescope in the world. And it imaged the sun uh, to see the size of the convection cells. And the convection cells are only the size of Texas. Now, I mean, I realize Texas <laughs> believes, you know, is a big state, but that's the size of the convection cells. These convection cells are can be a quarter of the size of the star. And remember, the star extends um, um, all the way out to, to Jupiter. <laughs> so we're talking about really, really big convection cells. Now, theorists are trying to reproduce that. And in the middle, there's a, a, a one of the more successful ones. But reproductions, but they can't quite get the big cells that we know are there that we observe. Uh, again, on the right, there's uh, different epochs of these uh, observations in the um, in the infrared, and you see that the bright spot moves around the star. At these bright convection cells appear at different at different part different parts parts of the star. Now, in the ultraviolet, because it's so big, we can also do something else that's amazing and wonderfully powerful. And that is 
to obtain a spectrum of a particular part of the star, which we could only do on the sun. <laughs> and now we can do this with Betelgeuse. So what we did was we uh, took the uh, an aperture, which is shown here in the left figure. It was a, it was a uh, square a square aperture, and we moved it at all these different positions and obtained a spectrum um, of the gas at those different positions. And by looking at the lines of the, in that spectrum, we could determine the rotation of the star. We could determine which part, one part of the star is coming towards us and another part of the star is, is, is going away <laughs> as, the star, as the star rotates. And in the right, you see our original image with the bright spot. And this is consistent with the pole um, of, of Betelgeuse. In other words, that it's, it's rotating now, as you look at it, in a, a counterclockwise direction. And that arrow points from the, um, from the bright spot with this particular angle um, is indicating the axis of rotation of the star. And, and so shortly afterwards, uh, people observing in the infrared found a plume of material coming from this particular direction. So this suggested to us that it was very interesting and that maybe um, the pole is a special place where it's very easy for material to, to be lost. These supergiants are losing material all the time, uh, much more than, than our own sun, uh, maybe a million times more per year in terms of mass than our own sun. Um, and so the question is, where is this material coming from? Is it coming from the poles? Is it coming from the equator? And where it originates uh, affects the surroundings around it and also affects how fast the star will be spun down by the by the torque of the of the wind. If it's coming out of the material is coming out of the pole, uh, it's not going to affect the rotation of the star at all. But if it's coming out of the equator, it can slow down the rotation of the star. And also remember, it's in equatorial regions is where we're frequently finding uh, many exoplanets. So that tells us something about the environment of exoplanets around other stars, which is itself very interesting. Okay, um, Alma has also observed uh, the uh, Betelgeuse using molecular emissions such as uh, silicon oxide. And they found at that time that material was coming off the, the north, I, I'm trying to think, the northeast of the star. We were looking at the southwest earlier. This was a number of years before. And then uh, subsequently about um, 15 or 20 years later, they found material coming off in the other um, direction. Again, suggesting that the mass's outflow is to the northeast and that there is some polarization uh, measurements which suggested that, that dust is forming after the material has been uh, ejected from the, from the surface of the star. Okay, so it was in 2019 or 2018 when um, I began to think that it, we could really learn more about how this star is uh, losing material. We can learn what's driving the material. We can learn what it's made of if we put a group together. Um, and so we we got together, uh, I got together about 30 people from all over the, the, the world, literally, and we call ourselves the mob for, for months of Betelgeuse. And the idea was that starting in 2019, we would observe Betelgeuse with anything we could get our little hands on, whether it was the Hubble Space Telescope or radio telescopes or interferometers or interferometers at the Naval the Neupoi interferometer, the LBT, whatever telescope we could have, we would all start looking at Betelgeuse. And it, Betelgeuse responded, they must have known <laughs> we were looking <laughs> because at the end of 2019, things started happening. Now this is a uh, photoelectric photometer light curve made by with photoelectric photometers, not visual. It's, it's made with optical visual light, but done with a photometer. So this is more precise than a um, visual estimate. And so this is a collection from the uh, American Association of Variable Star Observers from the past, roughly the past seven years. And you can see that, that the magnitude is, is, is uh, pretty, pretty consistent. There's a gap, now you know 
you all should know why there's a gap because what happens is Betelgeuse gets too close to the sun or the earth moves in a direction such that in its orbit that we can no longer see Betelgeuse because it's behind the sun. So that's why we have these little gaps and you can, you can gather what goes on in, in between the gaps. But we're seeing pretty much a nice 400 day period and, and it doesn't get fainter than about, oh, I don't know, 0.8 or so or something like that. Well, until, until December 2019. And you can see what happened here. This is when um, trouble, as I said, trouble started because it started getting fainter, okay? I mean, like it really did. Uh, and it started going down, down. And around the beginning of January is when we had our annual American Astronomical Society meeting in Honolulu. And we were all outside looking at the constellation and couldn't believe it because it just looked so absolutely abnormal. I mean, Betelgeuse was missing. It was it was faint. It wasn't. It it just didn't look right at all. And um, of course, people and and the um, and the news media and everybody was just were just crazy about it. The Twitter sphere went wild. Um, I, I went on Twitter and looked, and someone said, "I pre my calculations show that it's going to explode tonight." And then he wrote hashtag hide well i'm not i'm not quite sure where you hide but <laughs> anyway everyone was very excited about what was going on and the trouble as i said started uh, in december it uh, really then bottomed out uh, at about 1.8 magnitudes visual magnitude uh, in the early part in the early part of february so let's think what could happen. The, the, obviously, people were concerned that this might be the beginning of, <laughs> of a supernova. Um, it's interesting because we astronomers don't know what happens right before a star becomes a supernova. Uh, we know maybe six months before, maybe a year before, two years before, because you had to be lucky just to have an image of the field before, you know, the hour before or, or the day before uh, a star turns into a supernova. Um, when the Rubin telescope is up in Chile at the, in an, I guess another year or two, we're going to have nightly patrols of much of the sky. And so maybe we'll be, be able to answer that question. Um, when we, we have that sort of data. But right now, if you look at the, um, the projected, now this, this is a theor theorist <laughs> projection, um, that right now Betelgeuse is in the, this stage where it's fusing helium uh, to carbon. And then it's going to become more and more, we believe, unstable. And the times that are estimated um, suggest that we're in this stage for about 500,000 years. Then we move to carbon to neon for maybe six, 500, 600 years. And then things start progressing very quickly, uh, according to the theorists. Neon to oxygen in a year, oxygen to silicon, six months. And then in one day, <laughs> the core. <laughs> Silicon fuses into iron and this whole thing collapses. Um, when that happens, uh, it's going to be bright. Um, it will be a supernova and we believe there'll be a neutron star and it's going to be as bright as the moon. These are some, some uh, predictions about the, the brightness of possible explosions and, and here is a, a full moon up here. So, uh, you know, as I said, it's a, 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 theorist, a theorist theory, and it may be uh, brighter. Of course, it also may be fainter. We'll see. But is it going to happen tomorrow? Well, I doubt it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but let me tell you what we found. Okay. At the same time that the optical um, light became uh, dimmer, um, the folks at the um, Stella observatories on T8 in, uh, uh, in Tenerife, in the Canary Islands, they've been observing it with uh, automated, these are robotic telescopes that obtain high resolution shell optical spectra. 
and they found that in November of 2019, there was a maximum outflow. This shows the motion of the optical surface. And you see that it moves out in this direction and then it moves back in again, and then it moves out again. This is the pulsational period that we see and that we, that we know. And they found that there was an extended long maximum outflow of material right around November 2019. And then it, the photosphere, this is the surface, started falling uh, back in again. Now we were using uh, the Hubble Space Telescope at that time. And we were able to take an aperture that's shown by this white rectangle here and position it at eight or 10 positions, moving it, whoops, sorry, moving it um, across the ultraviolet image of the star. And we were able to measure the magnesium two lines. This is magnesium that has lost uh, one electron and it's, uh, we call it singly ionized. And then we could look at the strength of these lines as we move across the disk of the star. And what we found was that this is a plot showing you position across the star. So this is the northwest. So this is up top here on the right. And then down as we move across here to the southeast, that's the position along this axis on this end of the axis. And we found that during September, October, and November, that's marked by the red points, there was an enormous enhancement of this hot magnesium, ionized magnesium material just over the southern part of the star. Okay, it was a cloud of magnesium too in the southern hemisphere. And we could obtain, we could see this by looking at a spectrum. Now a spectrum is an extremely powerful piece of data <laughs> because with the spectrum you can tell what a star is made of, you can tell how fast the star is moving, you can tell how fast different levels in the star are moving. You can use very sophisticated um, diagnostic techniques to tell, measure directly what the density of the star is at, the, at different levels in the atmosphere. It's a, it's a very powerful tool. So we, we were obtaining spectra all through this whole minimum. We started actually in um, January of 2019, right after the mob <laughs> got put together and we started our, our Hubble. We uh, were lucky, I was lucky enough to win a three-year program on Hubble. And so we started it in January of, of 2019 and March where these red lines are marking. Uh, again, Hubble cannot see it from about April through um, the beginning of September just as you, it's hard to see from the ground. And we then made measurements and visited it all the way through the minimum and out. And at the same time that the magnesium enhancement started, we had a maximum outflow velocity from the lower levels. Magnesium is formed higher in the atmosphere than where we're measuring the radial velocity. Now let's go back here. What do we do? There we go, okay. So what did we find out? We could look at the spectrum in detail and find by looking at the ratios of certain lines, these are uh, lines from carbon, which has lost an electron as well. And by looking at the ratio of these lines, this tells us what the density is. And so we measured the ratio at that Southern part of the star. And that we show in the right figure where you see the ratio at the Southern part of the star goes down, gets smaller. These, in these red, these red uh, squares, as opposed to uh, February, March, and April in 2020, and as opposed to when it was in, in what it, uh, the value was in January and March of 2019. So that's telling us that this is a, a cloud of increased density, that this is, this is a, a denser cloud um, of material than had been there previously. We can also look at the line profiles. There, these, this is another very um, uh, in, uh, powerful way <laughs> to understand the dynamics of an atmosphere. And we see in the left figure what the normal line profile looks like. There's just a, there's a central reversal and two little bumps. And then we find from this is a simulation of passing a pulse of of a shock wave through an atmosphere, we find that the short wavelength side, the blue side of the line, which is the part that's coming towards us, gets very strong and then it reverses as the wind develops and becomes more opaque. 
And when we look at the profile of the magnesium two lines, the signaling ionized magnesium, we find the same change in profile that's indicated by these simulations. So we see that there's dense material moving out for a period of, of three months in the southern part of the star. Okay. This time, as we've seen, coincided with the maximum uh, outward radial motion. And so what we suspect is that there was a bright convective cell, and you see a little cartoon here, which is courtesy of the folks at Space Telescope, who were so excited about this too, um, that there was a bright, hot uh, cloud of material ejected from the star, perhaps enhanced because the, um, the photosphere was also moving out for a long time. And it changed dramatically the profiles of the lines. I just, we show you some profiles here that in, um, in uh, um, you know, March, January, March, they were low like this. And then in October, when it, the material was very prominent, it was stronger, it was hotter, it was moving out. You can see the line changes uh, dramatically and then it retreats back. So when the optical was very dim, this is February 3rd, 2020, uh, the chromosphere didn't know anything about it. It was all gone and <laughs> had passed through and was, was gone. Okay, at the same time, in December, um, Miguel Monteric from the uh, Observatoire de Paris um, has got time on the VLT. These are the very large telescopes that are run by the European Southern Observatory in uh, Paranal in Chile. And they made images um, with these telescopes used as an interferometer. And they compared the image that they had obtained in January, which you see on the left, with what they found in December. Now, this is after we saw the passage of this cloud of material in September through November, and they see that the appearance of the star, this is invisible light, uh, that we're looking at the surface of the star, and you can see that it looks dramatically different. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, it's down by about a factor of 10. Something has happened uh, to the whole southern part of the southern hemisphere of the star. And the modeling that they've done uh, with this indicates that dust may be the culprit, um, and that would produce such an such a uh, such an image. And so, what we think has happened is that this um, cloud of material was ejected from the south uh, east part of the star, not from the pole on the south, but from this part of the star was ejected, uh, moved out into the atmosphere, it became cooler, and when it becomes cool, then dust can form. And we believe that a dust cloud formed in late December through February that then blocked part of the, uh, part of the southern hemisphere of the star. They also measured increased polarization, and they do think that perhaps the part of the star is cooler where that material left the star. There's some indications from um, submillimeter observations that the surface is now a little bit cooler. Okay, now you saw those empty spaces where we couldn't keep track of Betelgeuse because it went too near the, too close to the sun. Well, um, we realize there's a way of getting around that and that's offered by the satellites, pair of satellites, now only one, called Stereo. Stereo is a solar, pair of solar satellites, and the idea is that it, these two satellites are in the orbit of the Earth, but one precedes the Earth and one trails the Earth. And the idea of the stereo um, mission was to photograph the sun from two different angles so that they could then um, get a three-dimensional picture of how the outer atmosphere of the sun behaved. Well, I also realized that they have a big camera with a 70 degree field of view. And I thought, gosh, Stereo A is trailing the Earth by two and a half months in the Earth's orbit. So what that means is when we cannot see it in June and July, 
Oh, for stereo, it's fine because stereo thinks it's March and April and they have no problem. And so those folks at Goddard were so great. I, I gave them a call and said, could you do this? And they said they would. And they had to roll the spacecraft out of contact with, with uh, the ground, with us. And they took pictures of the star field around Betelgeuse and other comparison stars. And so you see by the little red stars marked here in this plot, we were able to find out and fill in what's been happening and what's been going on um, in 2020 with, with, um, with Betelgeuse. And you can see that it started getting um, weaker and weaker, uh, but then it got brighter again. So um, we're not quite sure what's happening. <laughs> Here's the latest, and I have data in here from just a few days ago. Um, it's it's this is this is the big minimum down here, and then and this is a marked by a sign. Put a sign curve in here, indicating the 400-day period. So there's a minimum here. Oops, sorry. I'm gonna gotta 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 go back. There's a minimum here. There's another minimum here, and that's the 400-day 420-day pulsation period. And then we need another one at the end of March. Now, is that going to happen? I don't know. Stereo has filled in some data points for us with these, these red um, stars. Um, it started getting brighter again, and then we think it may be turning over, but is it going to meet its minimum? This is the minimum that we predict that it should, should reach if it's going to mimic the pattern um, that we've seen and know and love for, for years. <laughs> so um, I just don't know. <laughs> uh, it looks like it, it, it's not clear it's going, to, it's going to meet what we expect. And of course that's interesting too, because did this outburst somehow change a fundamental property of the star? I just don't know. But keep your eyes on it, think about it until it goes into the sun and we have stereo again. Those kind folks have agreed to go back again when we can no longer see it. So we'll find out what's really happening. So we should enjoy this beautiful star while we can <laughs> before it vanishes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hey, Andrew, hey, Andrew. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Let me, can I escape now? Let me escape and come back. Yep. I think so. There we go. And let me come back to you if I can. Here we are. And I'll stop presenting. Okay, there. Yeah, I don't, uh, I, think, I think I don't have anything there. more I to present. <laughs> with great briefing. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things we don't, you don't get is the interaction when you do virtual. It's sort of like your briefing, I, a TV I monitor, right? Or whatever. But we I, have a whole chat room full of questions for oh you. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so, okay. So, so if you could bear with us and uh, spend a, just a couple more minutes, uh, maybe we'll go through some. Oh, um, sure. I'm, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> okay. So um, I wrote down most of these for the, for the guys in our group, guys and gals in our group. But uh, I'll call on you. You can, you can read your own okay. question. But um, so Manjunath, uh, you had a question. Uh, Several minutes ago, about uh, you want to you want to take come off mute and and ask your question. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I just wanted to know if uh, Betelgeuse was uh, once a smaller star like the sun, and then it has no. big, big no, now. No, no, no. <laughs> it never was small like the sun. Um, it, it it it's much more massive uh, than the sun. It's about twenty times more massive than the sun. So it started out big, and then it got even bigger, okay? But, and, and it's much bigger than the sun, much bigger. That's why we're seeing things that are completely different, because remember, when the sun also um, has, is very small, and it has a very high gravity, uh, meaning, you know, things weigh a lot on the surface of the sun. But, but this star is big and puffy and enormous, <laughs> and, and we're seeing completely different physics. So we're really, we're really learning. Um, I, I don't have a lot of all the answers. I, we think we understand this, but you know, it's, it's totally different phenomenon. When we first imaged the surface and saw this big hot spot, which was 
25% of the of the um, cert, the apparent size of the star. That's something we never thought about before. As a matter of fact, theorists can't even make it now in their in their modeling. So, right. so that's why you've got to go out and and look and see what's really there and measure it and try to figure it out. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we'll go to Henry. Um, Henry, uh, do you want to come off mute and ask your question? Uh, yes, if you can hear me. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, I was curious. You mentioned when the mob formed, I guess. Um, <laughs> you guys started to increase the observations. But yes. It wasn't, it, 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 it just seems such a coincidence that, that this dimming occurred when you increased <laughs> the observations. And it wasn't caused by the, you know, <laughs> not caused by, but it wasn't the increased observations that, that made no. it. Oh, it been <laughs> no, all no. Along. No, no, we were just very lucky. <laughs> That's all I can say. <laughs> no, no, I know okay. that there were a lot of a lot of people blamed us, saying <laughs> it's because you're looking at it. <laughs> Remember though that the light started thirteen hundred in thirteen hundred A.D. It takes seven hundred years. This is old light, old photons. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right, but I'm thinking more like the old analogy about the tree falling in the woods. If you don't hear it, if you if if you weren't looking for this, you might not have seen it before, and now you're looking. But yeah, that's true. although although the photometry and the visual ob observations show it, it never got this faint before. Uh, you know, it just hadn't. So, and and the fact that it's going off at another angle, we're still. I'm puzzled about that because a lot of people think material should just come from the poles, but with Hubble, it was coming out at an angle. Um, we're working on that. I mean, it could be like, you, you know, the sun has what we call these coronal mass ejections, coronal mass ejections, where the magnetic field changes and suddenly a material it goes out really, really fast. Um, and maybe that's what we're seeing, but we've never seen anything like it before. So right. we're going to keep looking. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah, you. That, that was a good question, Henry. I was kind of thinking along the same lines, but uh, pay, pays to be lucky, I guess. Sometimes. No, we didn't. We didn't make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, uh, Julia, if you're on still. Hi, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I was just curious, uh, you said the the um, fusion of, of helium to carbon would last 100,000 years. Do we have a sense of how far into that 100,000 years we are? No. <laughs> Put, put it in the middle. <laughs> this is this is all all modeling modeling dependent, um, and it, it's tough to make models of stars when you, you know you can't get inside them or, 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 or figure out you know whether you've got the right physics and things. So I, I, you know it's it's not going to go supernova tomorrow. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe maybe as as you said, Henry, maybe we we're, we're inciting yeah. something. I, you know. Hey Andrea, do these do you, do you is there any chance of exoplanets on uh, around Betelgeuse or is it just not the type that works? <laughs> well that's that's a question. Generally we're not finding them around luminous stars, supergiants. To my knowledge, we have we find them around giant stars. And we find them around uh, like M dwarfs because it's easy. It's easy to find them. As a matter of fact, we hypothesized that it had eaten had the last supper of some exoplanets because there's a problem. There's a problem the fact that it's spinning too fast. Um, we can measure how where the axis is, and we can measure how fast it's spinning. And and if we think about how it was formed on the main sequence, and then as it expands it should slow down and it's going too fast. And now you can say, how is it going? Why is it going too fast? Well, one possibility is that it swallowed planets. <laughs> Another possibility is that that uh, it was a binary, um, that, that, that it was a binary and that actually when it expanded, it, 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 uh, uh, and, you know, to, 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 took in the other star and that other star spun it up a little bit. 
um, we're, we're not sure. There, there are some models that say it was a binary, uh, and because something seems to have spun up the star that's puzzling. <laughs> yeah, okay. Hey, Kevin, uh, if you're out there, what's your question? Oh, uh, yeah, Andrew, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, my question was, I noticed on the uh, light curve that the minimum of Betelgeuse was actually getting deeper long before the big drop. Did that attract anyone's attention? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> drop. The big drop was the big drop. <laughs> and, uh, it, 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 well, it, we, they call it a semi-regular variable, and that gives you a lot of room. <laughs> you know, uh, like like the period could be the, the pulsation could be 400 days or 420. I, I happen to like 420, 430, 435. And then people have run, uh, you know, period finding um, uh, software and analysis on all of this. And so you have a range of periods, which is why it's called semi-regular. And people, and, and the fact that sometimes it's a little brighter or dimmer, I mean, people would then say, well, we had a convection cell that made it brighter on the surface, and that just made it a little brighter or not so bright. Right now, it's kind of wiggling around, which I don't think we've seen before. And we are also getting better coverage because we're getting stereo, which is wonderful. In other words, we can we can watch it all the time. <laughs> we tried for New Horizons, um, or or, the, or we tried for the, the, not not the old the old rover, not Perseverance, but the other one. And the trouble is, two problems: there are dust storms on Mars because we thought if we were on Mars, we could also see it, you know. But there are dust storms. <laughs> That's not good, as you know. Um, secondly. Um, th they have to turn it off at night to conserve power. So, so the the rovers on Mars only operate in the daytime when there's there's uh, solar power, and they can they can have enough power to, to to work. So that's not working. But but stereo is, and those folks are so great. They actually have to they 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 have to go out of contact with JPL or NASA whatever for two hours while they they flip the spacecraft over and then they take about 20 images for us and then flip it back again so that they can download the data and be back in contact. So that's been wonderful. So okay. thank you very much. <laughs> hey, we'll go to Linda next. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Thanks. Um, so you talked about uh, the ultimate fate of Betelgeuse becoming a supernova, but is it possible that it would blow off enough material here that that wouldn't happen? And if not, uh, do we know that it, if it, is it destined for a neutron star or a black hole? No, it, it seems to be. A, it's going to have to lose a lot more material. To, 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 it's, it's losing a lot of material now. I mean, it's losing a million times more than the sun um, now. But it would have to be much more. <laughs> but we've, never, we've seen other stars losing material. There's one star called V.Y. Canis Medusa. Canis Majoris, yeah, that's also a supergiant, bigger than Betelgeuse, but but it's farther away, so you can't, um, see, you know, look at the surface, but you can look at what it did around in the circumstellar medium. And what's really interesting is um, this is done by Roberta Humphreys at the University of Minnesota. Um, she's found these little wisps of material that have been thrown off in different directions and she can measure how fast they're moving. And then she m m brought the time back to find out when they left the star. And it was always when there was a minimum in the light, in the starlight. So we're trying to piece this all together, but it's not going to, it's not going to be a neutron star. It's going to be like 87A, you know, uh, 1987A that just blew up and I don't think they've even found they've been looking for a neutron star there and I don't know if they've even found it yet so it's but Betelgeuse is closer so we'll see thank you <laughs> thank you <laughs> thanks Andrea I'm looking down the line here is there anybody that I might have missed oh uh, Bob uh, Rob Parks sorry thanks for joining us Rob appreciate appreciate you coming tonight did you have a question you wanted to ask I guess let me ask for the a, temperature, so a, a question popped up about the temperature. Okay. 
I saw it was, someone asked this. I, I just saw it, it, um, it came up in the in the bottom of my oh, screen. Oh right. It's about, okay. about thirty five hundred degrees. The 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 con, uh, this is on the surface, the the visible surface that you see, and then there are also these hotter convection regions, which may be hotter by. 500, 600 degrees over that 3,500. But then as you move out in the atmosphere, um, the, the temperature rises. Um, and, and it may be as a result of like alphane wave heating, such as we have in the sun or shock heating, but the temperature rises. But the maximum temperature is only about, oh, I don't know, maybe 15, 20,000 degrees. And it's very inhomogeneous. I mean, there's molecules, there's there's hot gas, <laughs> there's a lot going on. Um, but but the temperature, the surface is about 3,500 degrees, and then hotter convection cells, and then a warmer outer outer atmosphere. But not as warm as the sun or as other giant stars or a lot of other stars. The atmosphere only goes. I think George, the highest we see is carbon two. We don't see any of this the uh, uh, diagnostics that we see in the sun, like carbon four or silicon or oxygen or x-ray, no x-rays. We tried with Chandra also, when, when that thing got really faint, there was a thought that maybe everything was falling in and you'd get shocks and you would get um, uh, shocks and you would get uh, uh, x-rays. But we looked at it, we got Chandra to, to look at it and no x-rays. <laughs> if they were produced, they sure didn't get out of the dense atmosphere. So. Someone asked what molecules are there? Oh, there's lots. <laughs> titanium oxide, vanadium oxide, silicon oxide, um, uh, I think CO2, CO, uh, water, um, H2O. <laughs> there's a couple of questions kind of similar. The, how big is the core? How hot is Betelgeuse? How many layers are in Betelgeuse? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give us kind of a roll up of all of those? <laughs> you want a roll up? Um, how well the, the surface is about three thousand degrees, but then you go to millions of degrees as you as you get it, go in into the into the core because that's where you have nuclear reactions going on. It's a nuclear reactor, <laughs> and then and then it gets cooler and much like I mean you move away from a stove or something and it gets cooler with distance. So the surface is much cooler than the, than much much cooler than the core. But then it gets hot again and that's the puzzle where we think it's either heated by magnetic fields um, or or by perhaps contributed to by shocks. That are coming that are that are uh, coming from the um, uh, you know from the pulsations uh, it's interesting that we've measured a magnetic field on on betelgeuse and the magnetic field on betelgeuse as a star is equal to that of the sun in other words if you look at the sun as a star we get a very weak magnetic field one gauss or something i mean very weak but we know that when we look at different parts of the sun, like you look at, at, at sunspots or something, you can get kilogauss fields, really you know, strong fields. And you, we also know that when we look in x-rays at the sun, you see, you see uh, plasma, hot gas, being confined by magnetic fields. You see these great loops of hot gas. So, so we may be in for more surprises <laughs> when we <laughs> develop more techniques. <laughs> We'll see. <laughs> okay, let's go back to Rob Parks. If you're if you're there, Rob, you can ask your question. Whoops, I'll just take it off mute. Still having trouble hearing you. Looks like you're off mute, but can't hear you. Um, basically, Rob's asking if there been any IR surveys of Betelgeuse that might point to previous events like this. Ah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, what, I, what I was interested in is if there have been any wide angle uh, IR surveys to see whether or not there have been you know, bow shots or just- you Oh, know, yes, to... yes, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, Betelgeuse is odd in that it's a very high velocity star. And so, so something <laughs> happened at some point. <laughs> um, and, and if you look at a larger scale, they've been doing this with Herschel, which is a, uh, a satellite, a, a, um, a satellite launched by the European Space Agency. And you see a bow shock in the direction of its motion. And you see 
arcs. I mean, you see a lot of material. I mean, it's been losing material for a long time. And you can't see the bow shock. And then you also see to off to the northeast. I have to think because astronomers work differently from maps. And so I'm always thinking left, right, east, west. <laughs> but, but to the northeast, there's also a very funny um, bar-shaped um, uh, bar shaped interstellar gas like a cloud and people don't know what that is whether it's somehow a remnant of the the me interstellar medium in which it's, it's running through but you can see an arched bar shock um, uh, you, you know in the direction of which bow shock <laughs> bow shock in the direction in which it's moving Yeah, I'm just looking through. Is there anybody else? Uh, well, I'm looking here quick, and uh, and then we'll wrap up. But uh, uh, well, you're being compared. You're being compared to Carl Sagan. That's one of the comments I like. So that's oh, oh that's, my. <laughs> that's I how knew you go. Carl. <laughs> Carl was at Harvard for a while. Then he went to Cornell. Um, yeah. 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 Yep. Um, Andrew. Yeah. Um, that's George. Does anyone, does any, yes, does anyone dare to put magnetic fields in these models of metal use? Listen, I can't get them to put chromospheres on these models. <laughs> Never mind. Never mind yeah. magnetic fields. No, they, they, they measured variable magnetic fields uh, from the star as a whole. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's where we're at right now. And, and to me, the surprising thing is that it's the same value as the sun measured as a star. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it seems to me we could hide a lot <laughs> in that. Um, I'm actually thinking that what we really saw was a chromospheric mass ejection and that it went out the southeast and then it moved across. And I'm working on that. I'm not sure other people believe it, but I mean, we think it went out. And we have a big nature paper we've been not fighting with, but nature takes forever, ever, ever. And we yeah. have a sequence of subsequent images that we took all through uh, 2020 uh, that Miguel has, and we're all involved in that. And he's been modeling it. And he, he likes best of all the dust, the dust model. Although he can, by tweaking it, Calculating this stuff is very difficult because once you start saying it's going to be dust, uh, th there are all kinds of parameters that you can play with. You know, the, the makeup of the dust, the size of the grains, the density of the grains, <laughs> the mix of grains, the shape of the grains. Um, so you've got a lot of free parameters to fiddle with. Um, so it, 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 he's working on it. We, it should be out. We, we, we sent it back to the referee. Oh, God. Uh, maybe three, four weeks ago, and I don't know what's happened. <laughs> okay. Anyway. I want to get and one more was, in here. Uh, uh, oh, go ahead. That was the, you're referring to the uh, the bow shock cloud that you referred to a few moments ago? Yes. And uh, does that tell you a timeline for its ejection? Who? Um, yes, it probably could, and I don't know what the timeline is. <laughs> yeah, it probably could. But it's not like the, the, the other star that's sort of the poster child for ejections is this VY Canis Majoris, which is even a bigger supergiant. And that's where they've been looking with Hubble, and they see lots of things around it in all directions, you know, little knots of material. We don't see that from Betelgeuse. As a matter of fact, we've only seen, we've seen... Uh, the, 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 from the poles, and 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 the the North Pole is the direction in which it's moving through space. So we've seen it from the poles, both poles, and now what we saw from Hubble was from the southeast part of of the star. But we don't see anything like what uh, Vy Canis Majoris is showing, and that's where they could roll it back. Uh, but we don't see all those knots. Uh, that 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 uh, that the other star had. The other star is more massive um, and more luminous, so maybe it's behaving differently. But we're and looking. Does, <laughs> we're looking. Does, does that uh, correlate with any uh, CMEs that we've seen from our own star? Yeah, you you brought up something very interesting. <laughs> In my spare time now, I'm I'm I'm. I'm I'm wondering whether what we saw was was like a chromospheric mass ejection, you know, and that, that because and that would then explain why 
some people are saying that the surface is still is much cooler than it was because in our own sun, you know, when we talk, talk about them as coronal mass ejections, but in fact, some of them take out the material from the chromosphere, you know, way down low. And you can see it in optical lights like H alpha and stuff. Um, and, and we're dealing with a much, a star with much lower gravity. So I, it, it could be, that's kind of my secret hope that I'm going to be able to show that's what happened. We'll see. <laughs> Hey, uh, one one question uh, for you, uh, Andrea. Take, take us through what a supernova event would look like if we're standing here on Earth and this happens. Oh. What was the what is what's the progression of what we would see and how? how well, it's going to be it's going to be very very bright. Uh, it's going to be they say as bright as the full moon, and it's going to cast shadows in the daytime. Now. Will it? I don't know. <laughs> and then it will it will decay. It'll get fainter and fainter and fainter over a period of, of months. But all I can say is the nighttime astronomers are going to be very unhappy <laughs> because they want dark time in order to see the faintest possible galaxies that you could ever imagine. <laughs> and someone said there's only going to be one extra case of cancer due to due to cosmic rays or something. I, I don't it, Nobody <laughs> really knows, you know. <laughs> Actually, we're trying. It turns out that Harvard has a plate collection, um, and they they uh, th they were taking uh, photographic plates down at Arequipa, Peru, um, of the Large Magellanic Cloud, uh, right before 98, 97, 1987A went off, um, and. Uh, Josh Grinley, who is the fellow at Harvard who's, who's digitized those plates, um, has tell me, tells me that he's got the light curve right before it went off. And I've been trying to get him to talk about it, and he's almost there, so stay tuned. We think, we could, we think at least for 87A, we might have a really close to the, close to the explosion uh, photometry to see what's happening. Of course, that was a blue supergiant. And people will say, well, you know, this is a red supergiant, so maybe it won't be the same. I, I, you know, I don't know, but but it, it'll be, I believe, the closest um, a photometry that we have had for for a, um, a supergiant. I mean, for a, a supernova. <laughs> That's awesome. Any any other questions? Uh, it's kind of a last call. We've we've held you over. Uh... Yeah, I'm certainly, sorry you have you all so late. Okay. No, that's uh, we certainly appreciate you uh, <laughs> coming and showing us. Okay. I think you know um, one of the comments I like here is you know it, Betelgeuse is one of the few stars I can actually find, and it'll <laughs> never look the same after tonight. So um, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, yeah. We 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 certainly thank you, Dr. Dupree, for the time you spent with us and educating us and. Uh, um, you know, we're glad you're in charge of figuring this thing out because well, we'll see. <laughs> it's, uh, it's well, I'll come back and tell you what happens next next year. <laughs> okay, we'd, we'd love it. You're Great. always invited. Thanks uh, so much. Thank Bye, you, everybody. Bye, -bye. <laughs> Bye, -bye. members. We'll Bye -bye. see you in April, April 10th. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you. Okay, Good night, thanks. Everyone. Good night. <laughs>